Okay. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Um, I have one announcement or a pledge <laughs> or a plea. And then uh, I'll talk about lab for next Monday. And then we'll start the lecture on sampling and sample preparation. So um, I'd like to invite any of you or all of you to participate in our college ball team. Yes. Um, so try it out. Come to one meeting. Uh, you might love it. You might feel intimidated. You might just not want to do it this semester because you're busy. Just come find out what it's about. Um, I love it. Claire's love, love it. Mike, Michael? <laughs> Who is Michael? My son. My son loves it. So Claire, do you want to say uh, something about meeting times and how to find you, connect with you? Yeah, so um, it's a one hour commitment each time. It would be great to come to two meetings a week if you really want to be part of this, but at least come to one this coming week, right? The first meeting is this Tuesday, just to hear what it's about. I'll be just there to talk about uh, the beginning, what it is, and then you can see if you want to be part of it or not. Okay? All right. Good. Back to business. <clears throat> so before we start with the sampling and sample preparation, which is the last introductory chapter before we actually dive into the meat of the course, starting with chromatography next week. So um, before I go into this lecture, I just want to remind you all what you're doing in the lab. And it's related to the data analysis chapter that we covered last time. So it's a very introductory lab. You will, if you haven't had a chance to learn how to use lab utensils like pipettes, mechanical pipettes that is, volumetric pipettes, burettes, you'll get that chance to learn the technique as well as collect data to determine accuracy and precision. <clears throat> So read chapter four in the textbook. The chapter that you need in your lab manual is chapter six. Um, there is a lab safety document and sources of error document on Moodle or in your packet if you purchase the packet, so please go over that. Pre-lab quizzes are really due the morning of the lab. This first week we kind of were flexible about it, but please do turn in your pre-lab quizzes in the morning when you get to the lab. And you need your lab manual. Of course, you need your lab notebook. Make sure you update your lab notebook of this week's lab before you come to the lab. Hint, hint, I might go over lab notebooks. Uh, <clears throat> bring calculators. You need your laptop so that you can enter data right away. I'm going to be sending you over the weekend, if not today, tomorrow, the Excel sheet that you need to enter data. So you really need your laptops. And if you don't have one, we do have how many? Two that we can provide in the lab. Um, but I'm hopeful that you have your own and you can bring it with. Each person will be working individually to enter the data. You'll be working in groups of two in the actual lab, but entering the data is an individual process. Riley. Would be great where the data should go. And please come on time. Usually labs are packed. We really need the entire time. So please come on time or a few minutes early to get settled, get your lab coat, your name tag. So that'd be great. The doors will be open at least 15 minutes prior to the lab start time. Okay, any questions about next week's lab? Okay. <coughs> okay. 
to determine food quality and acceptance, it is essential to which one of these? Wow, you read it so fast. Uh, when Jane? B and C? Uh, okay. Anybody else? You all agree to B and C? Monique? <coughs> all of the above? Huh. Can we actually monitor everything if you have five ton production? Can you take this all of it and analyze it in the lab? Mm. Okay, so B and, B and C are the correct answers. We do evaluate sample, a representative sample of the entire lot. Most of the time, there are cases where you can actually evaluate the whole lot, and I'll, show, I'll tell you when. Um, and then you need to determine the sample size. In this case, I mean number of replication, number of samples, not replication per se, number of samples you need to withdraw to analyze or select to analyze. <clears throat> so B and C. <clears throat> okay, for sample preparation prior to analysis, the following is true. When thing? Sophia? None of the above. Okay, so we have two contradictory answers. Lynn? B and C is correct. You, we will talk about this. You wouldn't have known this, but some of, for some uh, testing, you need actually a 40 mesh size. Do you know what a mesh, can you define a mesh, Mallory? Yeah, but can you be more specific? What does 20, number 20 mean in this case? 20 mesh size. Ted. Mm, creative answer, but no. Billy? Okay, Got getting warmer. Amount, number of opening per linear inch. Not a, not a square inch, per a linear inch, how many openings you have. So the greater the number, the smaller the particle size that you will be looking for. Um, so for example, for analyzing protein, moisture, uh, you just need 20 mesh, but if you're doing an analysis that required extraction, like fat analysis, you're extracting the fat, you need higher surface area. So you would need 40 mesh. So it differs based on what you are analyzing. And obviously, enzyme activity and lipid oxidation will change the constituents and the quality of your product. You will have erroneous results if that happens when you prepare the sample, store the sample prior to the analysis. <coughs> so is it feasible to evaluate all foods or, or ingredients from a particular lot? So you have the entire population. So this is a whole, uh, the, the stack or mountains of grain, you won't be analyzing all of it for moisture content, for example. But say you have, you want to do a metal detection. So your grains can go on a belt and you can have metal detection for everything that passes over or uh, is on the belt. So you can do rapid analytical technique, like just looking at metals, presence of metals. It's not destructive, so you won't have to, you won't harm the samples or the, the product or the ingredient. But oftentimes, you need to destruct the sample by analysis or, you, or use extensive means of analysis, so you cannot be analyzing everything, so you will do sampling. So the samples will have to be representative. What does that mean, to be representative? They're not going to give a speech, the samples, right? Yep, Billy? Yeah, how can you ensure that they represent the entirety of the, of the lot? Yes, thank you, Emily. 
Yes, so you take representative samples, meaning you, you make sure that you take as many samples as needed, and not just that, you want to make sure that you're, there is a homogene, the homogeneity of the sample is, a, is appropriate to withdraw a sample that is representative. Another thing, you want to, statistic, statistical selection of the sample is important. So sometimes you're restricted, you cannot have statistical selection, but oftentimes you can do random selection and we can talk about that later. <clears throat> so having representative uh, samples, then it will lead to more accurate estimation and, like Billy said, reduce, uh, or Emily, <laughs> reduce variance. Uh, in order to do that and to ensure all of this, you really have to come up with a sampling plan. Sampling plan include that you need to determine sample size, how many samples you need to select, and that depends on different uh, factors. We'll talk about that. You need to determine sampling procedure. How are you going to extract the samples or, or select the sample uh, from a whole lot? So we'll talk about some of these examples as well. And then after that, there's sample preparation. How are you going to prepare the sample in a way that you'll get accurate and precise results. And after that, today we're going to also talk about sample storage and the importance of sample storage if you need to store it before your actual analysis. So many factors affect your choice of the sampling plan. And if we want to define sampling plan, <coughs> you'll find the definition in, on page 64. But briefly, you want to know the objective of why you are selecting samples for analysis. So what's the purpose of the inspection? This is including in your sampling plan. You need to know this because you're going to have a sampling plan for everything you're, an, you're going to talk about in your project. There is a section in the project report where you're going to have a sampling plan. So what's in the sampling plan, what is the objective of the um, analysis? Uh, what, are, what is the sample size? How you're going to select the samples? How you're going to prepare the samples? and how you're going to store the sample. So it is kind of like a um, comprehensive plan until you get to the actual analysis. So in order to set your plan, again, you, know, you need to know or define your purpose of the inspection. So you have to ask certain questions to figure out what the actual purpose is. The nature of the product, is it a homogeneous product? Is it a heterogeneous product? How big is the lot? What's the unit size? So when you take a sample, what's the unit size? Are you going to take a sample of like one can, or are you selecting 100 grams of a flower sample? So you need to ask yourself and define that in your sample plan. And other questions also. So this is a table, in fact, you'll find in your chapter, but it goes on. You need to also know what the nature of the test method is. Is it going to be a destructive, for example, or a non-destructive method? For example, if you're going to use IR to determine composition, then your actual sample can be used for something else. It's not going to be destructive. So you can make use of the sample in, for multiple tests. Um, how much does this test cost? If it costs a lot, so you'll have to rethink the sample size, can I analyze 10 samples or maybe five samples will be enough to get to a conclusion? Nature of the population being investigated. Again, how big is the lot? How uniform? <clears throat> and different questions that you can uh, look at. These are important when you want to summarize, again, your sample plan for the project. So there are two types of sampling. There's attribute sampling and variable sampling. So when we say attribute sampling, we mean randomly distributed attributes. Can you give an example of a randomly distributed attribute in a product that you might be looking for? So there is randomly and there is uniformly distributed. Lauren? Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to say this is 
a bad example, it's a good example. But I, if I don't want to look for marshmallows and I want to look for something that is critical to the quality of the product, can you give an example of that? Is moisture content supposedly uniformly distributed in a product? You say yes? Yeah. Okay, so I think there's, and let me clarify. Let's say you homogenized your sample, or the sample is homogeneous, okay? Let's, let's say it's a flower sample. It's a homogeneous, you didn't do anything to it. You didn't grind it, you didn't homogenize it yourself. Let's just say you have flour. Do you expect the moisture content anywhere in the sealed bag of flour would be uh, uniformly distributed? If we say it's completely sealed and nothing is coming in or out, huh? Completely sealed, processed, covered, no environmental impact. So the water is homogeneously distributed. Yes, uniformly distributed. Attribute sample for randomly distributed, let's say you have mold growth. So the mold could be anywhere in, in the sample lot, okay? You might generate mycotoxin and the mycotoxin might not migrate uniformly in, in your sample. So this is attribute sampling. We're looking at a very particular attribute that is not uniformly distributed um, in your sample. So when, when we have this, we are like fishing for a needle in a haystack, you need to de get a lot of different samples. You need to pull a lot of samples in order, if it's there, to find it. So in many cases when we're looking for attribute, we are really checking the presence or absence of a, var a variable that could really impact whether we or not we're going to accept this uh, lot. And an example here, I gave Clostridium botulinum in a canned good, so it might not be homogeneously distributed. Most likely it's not. So you need to take a lot of samples. Some cans might have it, other cans might not have it. So you want to make sure you select enough number of cans to determine the presence of this um, Clostridium botulinum in a lot of cans. You might have, a, I don't know, 100,000 cans produced per day. So you have to randomly select a huge number sufficient to make a decision. So um, depending on the organism that, or the um, constituent of concern that you might be looking for that is randomly distributed, oftentimes you shouldn't find anything. You shouldn't have any aflatoxin in your sample, okay? So the count is zero. So let's say you have measured, you found something, so there are two classes. Either if you find it, you go no because there's zero tolerance, or you say, okay, let me quantify, and if it is greater than a particular number, then it would be um, rejected, and usually, the tolerance level is different for different um, attributes. Okay, so variable samplings is for normally distributed attributes such as moisture. So you, when they're normally distributed, you don't need uh, a lot of sampling. So you will, your sample size or the number of samples you withdraw will be smaller relative to attribute sampling. And we're often looking for quantitative measurement or characteristics, you're not looking for either present or not present, we're mostly looking at getting a number, a value, that is on a continuous scale. <clears throat> and then based on that number, whether if we're looking to see if it meets standard of identity or if we're looking to see consistency of the product, we determine acceptability. 
Example, color, total solids, salt, um, etc. So how many samples to select for analyses? If we're looking at compositional analysis, for example, FDA and FSIS have specified sample size. For example, FDA requires that you take 12 samples and then form a composite of these 12 samples. That means, um, let's say, 12 cans, open the 12 cans, mix the content of the 12 cans, and then take six subsamples. FSIS requires that you take six samples instead of 12. But in both cases, you need at least six subsamples to analyze. So after you form your composite sample, then you need six subsamples to analyze. So there are different um, acceptance sampling plans. So there is the single accept reject based on one set of samples. So let's say your set of samples is 12 and you want to make a decision. So you take one set of 12 randomly and assess the defect. So N stands for number of samples you selected, C stands for the uh, number of defects above which you would reject. So you make a decision based on a single set of samples. Another form is when you make a decision based on double, that means two sets of samples. And here's an uh, illustration. <clears throat> so you have a population, you take your first set of samples, and you would have a certain number of defects below which you would say accept the lot above which you would say reject the lot, but if it is in between, then you need to, you're not certain now what to do, you need another set of samples. So if your number of defects is between the acceptance and the rejection number, you will take another set and then you will determine the number of defects. If the number of defects you found in the second set plus the number of defects you found in the first set are greater than a particular number, you reject. And the opposite is true. If they are smaller than a particular number, then you accept. So multiple acceptance is basically an extension of the double. So you continue doing that. Please put your cell phones away. Uh, if you need to use the phone, you can step out. I don't mind. OK. If you're doing the other uh, thing is sequential sampling. Uh, the sequential sampling also what you on the y-axis here you see the cumulative number of defects and here the cumulative number of samples that you are measuring. In this case, let's say you took 10 samples and you measured number of defects, you found six. You, com you reject right away. But let's say you took 20 samples and you found three defects, you continue sampling. You took 30 samples and you found zero defects, you accept. Took 35, found one, you accept, and so on. <coughs> when monitoring food safety by measurement of mycotoxin, which I already gave you an example. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next process, same number. What specifically are the numbers for? Okay, so if you're doing composition analysis, you have to follow this no matter what. That would be yours. Uh, but no, you don't always uh, doing composition analysis. It will be different types of sampling. So these are the different types of sampling that are out there. Good question. Okay. Here. So when monitoring food safety by measurement of mycotoxins, which one of these are correct or is? Katie? A. 
A is correct, but is it the only definite? A and C. So you want to get as many samples as possible to ensure that you have a representative sample for something that is randomly distributed. The sampling error is many times greater than analytical error. Usually the methods will have variability and will have error, but if you do a sampling mistake, the consequence is greater than the, the error of the analytical method. Um, single sampling plan will not work in this case. So because it, it doesn't specify the single sampling plan, it doesn't specify the exact number. And on top of that, there's zero tolerance for uh, presence of mycotoxin. So there is no number that you're seeing if it's greater or lower. OK. Um, so whenever you make a decision to accept or reject, there is always something known as consumer risk and producer risk. Of course, from a consumer risk perspective, if you accept um, a product that might have Clostridium botulinum or might have mycotoxin or might have another quality defect, then the cons you are basically impacting the safety of the consumer and the acceptability of the consumer. So before you accept, you have to be 95% sure that your product is of acceptable quality and is safe. Whereas the vendor risk, of course, you do not want to reject a lot that is good because this is, you're losing money. So you want to also be careful. But here the risk you can take um, is greater. You can have 90% confidence because you're here you're, not, you're impacting money, not profit, not really the health and the safety of the consumer. <coughs> Yes, Mallory. Uh, so the vendor can be the grocery store, but can also be the producer who sells to the grocery store. The grocery store is the customer to the producer. And like the supplier of ingredient is the vendor for the producer. The producer is the customer, so you have different chains. Yeah, if they are the consumers, then they will be, the liability will be on them because they're going to sell the product to the final consumers. Yeah. So when we talk about, well, this could be customer, if you want to say. It can, okay, I see your point. So it could be customer here, right? Because your customer is, can be the producer customer of the supplier, the grocery store, customer of the. So wherever it starts, you are impacting the next in line, basically, so which leads up to the final consumer. So like 30% Yes. Yeah, good summary, Carmen. Good. <clears throat> OK, so your sampling plan, it might seem complex as I'm talking about it, but when you, when you try to develop a sample plan, you want to think, what's the simplest sampling plan that I can work with, not complicate my life? So make it flexible, so not too rigid, like either 20 samples or not, for example. We need to make sure that to protect consumers and vendors or customers and vendors. Ensure reliability of the results. That's always by following the steps, making sure you have enough sample size, and you have good reproducibility, good method, um, so you have the reliability, you can trust your results, basically. So here's an example um, based on an AOAC method for selecting samples from flower. So oftentimes, your lots your lot is a number of bags of flour. So you might have 10,000 number of bags. So how do you determine 
to how to sample the, these bags and how to take sample from each bag. So if you get, if you want to do composition analysis, so you need at least 12 bags from 10,000 bags or whatever is the lot, uh, or 100 bags, depending on the size of the lot. So you need to figure out a way to select 12 bags, and from each bag you want to sample. Take a sample out or two sample out in this case, and then form your composite sample for composition and analysis. So the common way or the AOAC method that is approved is you get, take the square root of the number of stacks in the lot. So if you have 100, you will select 10. How to select them, we'll talk about random selection later. So you select 10, and then from each bag of the selected 10, you will want to take a sample from the core or um, diagonal to the core from one corner and take a sample from the other corner. And then, you, of course, you store the sample in clean, dry, well-sealed containers. <clears throat> so if it's a flower sample, it's homogeneous by nature. Went through the milling, everything is homogeneous. Uh, so the sample can be taken from any location, basically. However, if your sample is heterogeneous, so either you homogenize it or you have to take a sample from multiple places. So let's say sample is homogeneous and you're going to uh, select a sample. There are manual sampling, which you uh, can just use a um, tool, like universal core sampler, to take a sample. It's prone to human error. However, there's also mechanical samples, sampling that is built in within the unit of operation, where samples are withdrawn automatically at certain time points. Um, and of course, it has less bias, and these samples um, can be analyzed once they are withdrawn mechanically. So there are two types of sampling, uh, non-probability sampling and statistical sampling or probability sampling. So non-probability sampling is when you have um, like grains like that, and there are no bags and nothing to categorize or randomly select from, oftentimes you rely on judgment sampling. What that means is a person of experience that done this before, know what to look for, know where to grab a sample. So it is a subjective method. Restricted sampling, if you have a big silo of, of corn, let's say, big container, um, you cannot reach all places or bottom sides or bottom places, so you will have something called restricted sampling. So you will just get where you, you can reach. Yeah? Oh, sorry. It's okay. You have a question? No, I don't. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> that, that's good, too. I do that sometimes. Probability sampling, that's when statistics and randomly selected samples come to play. So you have the random sampling, which is probably you've learned this sometime during school, is you have random number tables. Have you heard of these? Okay. So let's say you have 100 bags of flour, easy example, or 100 num uh, cans of beans. So what you would do is you wouldn't give them random numbers from a random number table. And it's just you, you hold that table and then you go and then select. You can do that via computer too, randomly selecting numbers too nowadays. Maybe that's the olden day method. But basically you select random numbers from a random combination of numbers and then you select the samples that match these numbers. So here, there is no bias, no human bias, and then um, we will have a representative sample that way. Systematic sampling is, uh, like I said, when you have mechanical sampling um, procedure. So you have, you have mechanical sampling installed in the processing line, so the samples will be selected continuously at certain time points. 
So again, there's no bias in that. So stratified and cluster sampling, they're very sim uh, similar, but basically this is when you have, let's say, a company that produces tomato juice or tomato paste or whatever. And then um, you have multiple locations or plants that produce this product. So again, the plants are given random numbers and certain plants are picked and samples are taken from the plants, the different plants. The difference between stratified and cluster, in cluster sampling, not all the plants are uh, tested. So that means some plants will be selected to have samples to analyze, other plants will not be. So this is mostly for not just looking at a lot, it's looking at different plant production plants. The composite sampling, we talked about that, is you select uh, samples. It could be 12 if it is you're following FDA regulation, or it could be whatever that you have uh, made in your sample plan. You want to get 20 samples. So you select your samples, you combine them, you form a one composite sample, and from there you do subsampling you always need to do subsampling as your replication. You, either you are bound by regulation, like FDA requires six subsampling, or you have your own sampling plan. <clears throat> okay. Problems in sampling. Which of these are potential problems associated with sampling? that might result in reduced reliability. Anybody? Uh, oh. PNC. Claire, what did you want to say? So, all of the above, when you have non-statistically viable convenience, so because let's say you cannot reach the bottom of a silo and you have to get only from where you can reach, then th there is a potential uh, re reduction in reliability, okay? And sometimes you don't store your samples after you collect them properly, you like temperature abuse or um, exposure to light, exposure to oxygen then you will end up having reduced reliability because you're changing the composition of your sample. Of course, this is very obvious. You mislabeled your sample, so your results are not uh, reliable at all. Particle size of the sample, need size reduction. So give you an example from a formal capstone group. This is um, that's a good example. Um, so I walk in in the lab and they're trying to measure a fat uh, in potato chips. And they're using the Mujiner flask, which you will see and use in the lab. And they, were, they added their solvents and then they were vigorously and with all their heart shaking to extract the fat. And I look in there and I see whole potato chips in this flask. <laughs> it's like, what are you guys doing? Uh, you need to increase surface area of your sample in order to get what you need out of it. So it's very important that you um, reduce surface size, uh, surface air, or increase surface area by reducing particle size. Um, so in order to do that, oftentimes, because your sample might not be the right size, particle size, you need to do grinding. But let's say you have something that is sticky and high in moisture. Oh, good luck grinding that. So you might lose moisture grinding it, fat might stick all around the grinder, you will end up with a disaster, complete mess. So in this case, you have two choices. If you're able to get a representative sample, you can dry it uh, prior to grinding it. And oftentimes we freeze it and freeze dry it, that's a gentler, drying procedure, or you can take your sample, freeze it, and grind it frozen using a grinder that with, uh, what do you call that, liquid nitrogen or CO2? 
dry ice, no? You can put the dry ice in the, in the grinder, huh, no? Okay, but anyway, the idea is to freeze it and, and grind it while frozen. Um, and then you can uh, use a sifter to sift it so that you will make sure that you are the right size and you use uh, sifters with a certain mesh number so that you know that you want 20 mesh or you want 40 mesh. <coughs> okay, so you've got your sample, you homogenized it, it's ready to go for analysis, but you worked eight hours in the lab and you're done, you wanna go home, so you want to store your sample and then come back for it tomorrow or next week. We should eliminate or control enzyme reaction or activity. Why and how? Justin? So this, you're talking about how to control. Yeah, temperature control is one. Either you store it under, um, depend how, what enzymes you have, but often if you store it at minus 20, you should be safe. Sometimes you heat and denature the enzyme, but that's not a route you wanna go, depending on what characteristic you are measuring. What other controls? Ryan? You can dry it, yes. If you wanted to store it, you, it could be pre-dried. That's, yeah, one thing. Um, Walter. Yes, you can change the pH, lower or higher pH, if that won't impact the final characteristic that you are after. Sometimes also you can uh, add salt. By This will change the water activity. If the enzyme requires oxygen, yes, but the oxygen-free environment is for another one that I'm gonna ask you here. Okay, but why, again, it's important to eliminate the enzyme activity? <clears throat> yeah? Uh, the yeah, you change the composition. Sometimes you have a color change, a zymatic color change. Sometimes the enzyme will result in lipid oxidation if you have lipoxygenases or hydrolysis of lipid, if you have lipases, uh, proteases, all of these will impact the composition and the characteristic of your food. So avoid lipid oxidation, really that's where we flush with nitrogen after we put it in a container. Uh, we can also, what can also, what can we do as well? Other than flushing, removing the oxygen. What may cause lipid oxidation, Riley? Right, yeah, so auto-oxidation uh, auto or photo-oxidation, so you can uh, make sure it's an amber container or put an um, aluminum foil around it. Uh, another thing that you can do is actually add an antioxidant. Uh, if you extracted your oil, maybe add an antioxidant and then to avoid, um, if you wanna determine lipid oxidation in a couple of days. Or even better, do not extract your oil for analysis uh, way ahead of time. So just don't do that. Limit microbial growth. Katie? Yes, you can reduce water activity by drying if you don't want to add uh, salt. And again, why, but before how, why? We don't want microbes to grow. Yes, Claire? Well, you have the spoilage, but you don't really care about spoilage because these food are gonna be just for analysis, not to eat. Lauren? Um, maybe testing. That testing, sorry? I was thinking. No, why do we wanna limit microbial growth while your sample is stored prior to analysis, Sophia? It will, it will alter the characteristics, in, including the acidity of the product, huh? Mallory? Oh, yeah. So sometimes they might um, consume, like, sugars or... Consume. How do they consume it? 
Yeah, so enzymes. So they might have their own enzymes that they will digest and use it as food, eat it. Uh, so you will uh, basically um, change the composition. Now how? Drying, storing at low temperature, even and adding preservative. <coughs> So basically the theme of this is avoid sample alteration. So you don't want your sample to be altered in any way. Okay, so plus two credit due on Monday if you'd like to get the two credits, uh, two points. Uh, this is the question, I Number seven in the formula edition, I did not check if it's still number seven in the current edition, but here's the question, try to solve it, and I'll put up the key after Monday after you turn in your answer. So we have two minutes, I'm not gonna start chromatography, I'm gonna let you go, have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week.